700 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words concerning this man, Jesus, this chosen servant of God. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A, breeze, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus is so different than we are? He was never sinfully frustrated with people. He was never impatient with people. Now, he wasn't always nice by our maybe American um, relativistic standards, but because he confronted evil and he told the truth to people, but he was perfect. He always treated people the way they should be treated. No human ever loved God with all his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength. No human ever loved his neighbor as himself until Jesus. Now we are in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 5, but, but why is this particular story recorded? We're going we're gonna to see the story we probably perhaps have heard of this man Jairus and this woman, but, but why? Why this story now in the book of Mark? We've seen this idea of this kingdom of God, this this thing that, that Jesus is here to inaugurate. And, and it could appear that because it's so big, because it's such a big deal, this kingdom thing is too big for individuals. It's going to be a blessing to the Gentiles. We saw it's going to be the seed, the small thing that grows up into the most important thing. But just because this kingdom is so big, it's so amazing, does that mean it will not impact individuals? And we will see in our text today that on the contrary, that this kingdom of God will, it will impact individuals. Jesus cares about individual people. He came to save people, individual people. In the beginning of Mark chapter 5, we saw one such individual, a hopeless man, one man. Jesus was interested in this man. He had an army of demons living inside of him. He was totally alone and totally hopeless, as we saw last week, and yet Jesus crossed the lake, and went into a foreign land to rescue this one man. Today, in the second half of Mark chapter 5, we're going to see two individuals. They're different than the demon-possessed man in, in many ways, but they too were hopeless until Jesus arrived. So with that, let's read our text for this morning in Mark chapter 5, we're going to be reading from verse 21 until the end of the chapter. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. 
Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when he had put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the child was, uh, and went in where the child was, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray together. God, as we come to your word, we come to your word humbly. We are in much need of your grace. We're in need of your enlightenment. Open our eyes as the psalmist says, that we might see the wonderful truths of your instruction. God, we ask that as we have come together today, we have gathered together to worship you, that this truth in your word would impact our hearts, Lord, in such a way that we would be changed and that you would be glorified in us through this. We pray all these things in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. The first individual that we, we um, encounter in this story is this man named Jairus. He's the ruler of the synagogue. Um, he's the one who would organize the synagogue Worship, kind of like Glenn, church administrator of sorts, was this man. But unlike Glenn, he was probably a Pharisee. He was influential to say the least, had a prominent position. Now, the Pharisees, the Pharisees are the bad guys, right? They're the ones who've been coming against Jesus, who have been attacking Jesus. Well, This man comes and falls at the feet of Jesus, showing Jesus great honor and respect. And he implores Jesus, and the text says, earnestly, wouldn't you? 
his little girl, his daughter. His only daughter, Luke tells us, was about to die. I can't even imagine. He, he had raised this little girl for, for 12 years. And for the Jews, 12, 13 was when a, a girl became a woman. So she was just becoming grown up and about to become a woman. And she was dying. What's Jesus' response? Did he condemn this man because he was a part of a corrupt religious leadership? Did he reject him as, a, as the Pharisees and the scribes had done to him? No, he didn't. Now, did, did Robin Hood ever do anything good for the sheriff of Nottingham? No, he's the bad guy. But Jesus is different. And here, he goes with men. Now, as, as our, this gospel writer, Mark, as our author of this book, is prone to do, we have a bit of a whirlwind of a story. So Jesus is following Jairus to his house, and the crowds are pressing in, they're jostling about very closely, and into our story enters our second character, our second individual. Now, she is the opposite of Jairus in very many ways. First of all, she's obscure. She doesn't have a name, unlike Jairus, who is named. We don't, we don't know her name. Secondly, this is a woman. Now, Jewish society was a man-based society. Women were often marginalized, and, and men were viewed as more important than women. Third, she was unclean. Whereas Jairus was a prominent part of the society and the religion, the life of the Jews, this woman was on the outside. She was like a leper. She was unclean according to the law. She was unable to participate in religious life. She was ostracized from the society and from the religious community. She had a flow of blood. She had a, a woman's issue. And this wasn't a passing problem. It had been a problem for 12 years. Now, perhaps this could have been as a result of midlife changes in her body, but as most women didn't live to 40 or the, the times when those changes take place, most likely this was something that happened to her when she became a woman. At puberty, when she became a woman and her body changed, she had this affliction. And so if this is the case, it's likely that she had lived her whole adult life as an outcast, as an outsider, as an unclean person. She was probably not married. If she had been married or betrothed, she probably would have been divorced because a Jewish man wouldn't want to live with an unclean wife. Fourth, she was poor. Unlike Jairus, who had a prominent place in society, and the means to go along with that, she had nothing, or at least nothing left. Our text says in verse 26 that she had spent everything she had, and it didn't help. She had not only sought doctors, but she had suffered much in the hands of doctors. And if medicine didn't help you in that day, it probably made it worse, which this was the case. Fifth, she came in secret. Jairus came openly and publicly and asked Jesus for help. This woman didn't ask. How could she? She wasn't even supposed to be in a crowd, let alone touch a religious leader. It would be unthinkable for her to ask Jesus to touch her and to heal her. And yet, 
That's what she did. She got carefully close to Jesus in the crowd and touched his clothes. Now, why? Why did she think this would work? Was it superstitious? Was it she thought it, there was magical powers in Jesus' robe? We don't know exactly, but we know that she had heard reports about Jesus. And that was enough for her. The writer Mark, he says that immediately, which he says that word a lot, to propel the story forward, but in this case, it was instantaneously. As soon as she touched Jesus' clothes, she was healed. In verse 29, it says, immediately the flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. She knew that she was well. And Jesus knew too. He knew that she had been healed, but he stops. Now, think think of what's going on. Jesus is on this emergency rescue mission to Jairus, his daughter, who is about to die. And Jesus stops and turns around and he says, who touched me? What about the urgency? What about the girl who is dying? But Jesus stops. Now the disciples who are not as perceptive as they could be, but they respond probably the way we would respond. Jesus, there's a crowd of people. Duh. What do you mean, who touched you? Everyone touched you. But, the, but our text says still Jesus looked. He looked. Now, why did Jesus ask this? Did Jesus not know? Is this a case where Jesus' humanity was, his, his omniscience was limited? Some think that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that he knew. He knew that power had gone out from him. He knew that it was a woman. In fact, the way he said it would have been like, what, what woman touched me? And based on the way this is written and the way this narrative goes, I think that Jesus saw this opportunity to interact and love and care for an individual person. Verse 33. But the woman, knowing what happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So now it's her turn to fall at the feet of Jesus. Just like the demoniac, just like Jairus, she comes in fear and trembling and falls before Jesus. Why is she afraid? Well, she has just defiled a religious man. She has just violated the law. But she knows that she has been healed and is compelled to come forward. Now, time stops for a moment. In that moment, the woman comes forward and tells the truth. What's Jesus going to do? Is he going to condemn her? Is he going to rile up the crowd to stone her? Because she has just defiled him. And not only him, but she's defiled many others in the crowd by coming secretly and touching all these people. And Jesus says, daughter, God in human flesh calls this unclean, outcast woman daughter. In fact, this is the only time Jesus ever called a woman daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Her faith had made her well. What does that mean? Did she steal Jesus' power? Did she she heal herself? By her faith? 
faith, by nature, always has an object. And the most important part of faith is the object of one's faith. One commentator says it this way, her faith healed her in that it caused her to seek healing from Jesus. Faith or confident trust derives its value not from the one who expresses it, but from the object in which it rests. As we see in this narrative, it was Jesus' power that healed her. We saw Jesus said himself that he felt power go out from himself. But it was her faith that caused her to go to Jesus rather than somewhere else. It was her faith that caused her to reach out and touch him. Faith itself doesn't cause anything, but it relies on Jesus to cause all. So in this sense, it was her faith that healed her. But she would go through life knowing, she would know that her healing came from Jesus. Now listen, listen again to these parting words that Jesus says to this woman. Go in peace and be sound, be whole from your affliction. Think about those words. For a lifetime, she'd been dead. For a lifetime, she'd been outcast. For a lifetime, no peace, no wholeness, no wellness. And Jesus says that now she was clean and new and whole. Jesus transforms completely. He won't break a bruised reed. He won't quench the flame that is just about to die. He loved her. He, Jesus, he is amazing. Now, again, can't, I can't help wonder what Jairus is thinking during this exchange. Whether it took 10 minutes or just a few, Jairus knows that each moment is crucial. His daughter is dying. And this woman is holding everything up. Imagine the love of a father who just wants Jesus to come and save his little girl. And then his fears are realized. As soon as Jesus finished talking to this woman, news arrives that his daughter is dead. And the messenger suggests that he shouldn't bother Jesus anymore. But Jesus hears this and he tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Believe in what? Believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And so they go to Jairus' house and they find weeping and wailing. They find mourners. In that culture, they would hire professional mourners. That is not a job I would want. But they are there and they are weeping and wailing. They are showing outwardly the grief, the grief that this mother and father felt inwardly. And Jesus comes in and he says, Why are you weeping? She's not dead, she's just sleeping. Now, we need to be careful here. Was the girl dead? Yes, she was. It's evident from their response. They, they laugh at Jesus. They know what death looks like. They laugh and deride Jesus. Why? Why did Jesus say that? As it related to the mourners and as it related to Jesus, this girl... It was as if she was sleeping because she would wake up again. This death would not be the end. For the first time in history, this death would not be the end. We'll get to that a little more in a minute. So Jesus kicks them out. He kicks out all those people. He takes his inner circle of disciples and the mother and father, and he goes 
to the girl. And he takes her hand and he tells her to get up. Now, for Jews, a dead body was unclean. So Jesus would certainly be becoming unclean by touching this corpse, but not Jesus. Just as the woman's uncleanness did not make Jesus impure, but rather the opposite happened and he cleansed her, so now this death does not make Jesus impure, but life flows from Jesus into this girl, and she's raised to life. Immediately, verse 42 says, she got up and began walking. She was 12 years of age. And they immediately were overcome with amazement. They were amazed with great amazement, says the text. Now, two weeks ago, we saw the story of Jesus calming the storm. And in that, a picture of the greatest storm, death. The storm that doesn't let any escape. And so we can't emphasize, we can't overemphasize this enough, enough, Jesus. He brings this little girl to life. Ever since Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the consequence of sin? It was death. And from that time, Jesus had been working toward this plan of restoration and fulfillment, and he would conquer death. He had declared this kingdom, this kingdom of God to be inaugurated. Everything was going to be different. The thief, Jesus said, came to steal and kill and destroy, and that's what we saw last week with the demoniac. But Jesus came to bring life abundantly. He could calm the storm showing his authority over nature. He could cast out a host, an army of demons, showing his authority over the spirit world. He healed this chronic disease of this woman. He cleansed the impurity that separated her from fellowship. And now, death. He overcomes death. Of all the storms that have ever decimated people, the storm of death is the one that no one has escaped from until Jesus. Millions of dollars are spent each year trying to stave off death. But death ultimately prevails until Jesus. So his disciples who had been astounded by his calming the wind and the wave are obviously amazed. This miraculous power even over death. This is who Jesus is. Our last verse, Mark 5.43 says, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Again, Jesus knows that his time is not yet fulfilled for people to crown him as king, for people to try to rebel against Rome. And so he isn't going to let people move this process forward in his own time and in his own way. He will reveal himself. And so our section ends with Jesus being... Practical, I think. Taking good care of people. He says, get her some food. She's restored. She is well. Her body is healed. And now she'll need nourishment. One of the most amazing things, I think, about Jesus, when we read who Jesus is in the Gospels, he served people. The, the God of the universe served people, served sinful humans, served those 
whom he created. Later in Mark, we're going to see this beautiful, encompassing statement that Jesus makes about himself. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, and that is what his ultimate mission would be. But he cared about those people he encountered. He, what often stands out to us is the marginalized people like this woman, but he also cared about Jairus. He cared about this Pharisee who was in the group that were his enemies. And he cares about you. And he cares about me. He understands what is going on in our lives. And will he take away the pain? Will he heal our affliction? We don't know. Often he doesn't. But he has promised something better than healing. And that is eternal hope. He came to bring life abundant eternal life. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek and to save the lost. What if Jesus hadn't come? Where would you be? Where would I be? His cleansing of this chronic sickness reminds us of our greater need of cleansing, cleansing from our sin. His raising up of this dead girl reminds us of his power over death and what we need for him to set us free from the penalty of death that we deserve. So if you are here and you have not put your faith in Jesus, run to him. Trust him. Believe in him. And if you are here and your faith is in Jesus, cling to him. Cling to him all the more. He is a glorious Savior. He is a wonderful God, and he is a good King. May God be glorified in us as we become increasingly preoccupied with this Jesus. And may our love for Jesus overflow into a love that would demonstrate his love to the world. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we want to see you. Show us your glory more and more. Lord, as we contemplate the wonder of our King Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would stir in our hearts that our amazement of you would be reflected in our lives, that we would cling to you, we would trust in you. We love you, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship you and praise you corporately, and to hear and be taught by your word. Amen.